Tonight I would like to continue the deepening of our exploration of the teachings of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. <clears throat> and I'd like to begin by mm, dispelling some of what I sense or perhaps detect are a, um, uh, a somewhat of a demeaning of the, uh, the profundity of Ramana's teachings. I think there may be some here who feel like these teachings are too simple, that the real meaty teachings are more contained in Lacanian psychoanalysis or Deleuzean philosophy or Deridian deconstruction or some other postmodern formulation of uh, the nature of reality that uh, is more elaborated, perhaps uh, in some integral way with quantum physics or uh, mathematics and quantum information theory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think there's, a, there's maybe a subtle superiority complex that looks at Ramana's teachings as being kindergarten and we want to go to the real stuff that's you know, far more uh, esoteric and requires a more erudite vocabulary, etc. Well, I think that's totally incorrect and, uh, and I would like to... Uh, dispel that illusion as soon as possible because I think it, it's a result of a superficial uh, attitude toward one's own self-enquiry and, uh, and, and a rather uh, non-serious approach to the uh, necessity of transcending one's own ego and projecting on Ramana that he doesn't have much to say that would help us to accomplish that. And, uh, and thereby distracting one's mind into a focus on uh, a far more sophisticated but actually misleading approach that is, uh, is focused on the ego and on the uh, phenomenal derivatives and projections of consciousness rather than upon the source. So uh, I would like to, uh, to make it very clear that uh, not only is this inaccurate, but it's actually uh, untrue even in relation to those above-named theoreticians. So, for example, <clears throat> uh, Ramana's teachings have many predecessors, not only in the East, but in the West itself. And I think that uh, in the 20th century, there's probably a, um, a fairly universal acceptance among philosophers, particularly uh, European philosophers, that the greatest mind of the West, at least of the modern West since Descartes, let's say, the, the most uh, profound thinker of all of them, by far, was Benedict Spinoza. Some would prefer to call him Baruch Spinoza, but he changed his name after being excommunicated by the Jewish community of Amsterdam. He was a Portuguese uh, Jew who, uh, whose family left uh, to Amsterdam when he was very young uh, because of the... Um, still smoldering consequences of the Spanish Inquisition. I suppose we should say the Iberian Inquisition, since Portugal was equally implicated in that ghastly oppression, not only of Jewish communities, but of the Muslim communities, largely because uh, both the Jewish and the Muslim were uh, together, had, had created an alliance uh, that was based on the integration of Sufism with Kabbalah and which had already shown its power to, uh, to overcome the fundamentalism of the Catholic Church during the Italian Renaissance, uh, which was destroyed through the banishing of such thinkers as Pico della Mirandola and, of course, the burning at the stake of Giordano Bruno. 
And this oppression continued because <clears throat> the, the Renaissance thinking that all went back to the non-duality, not only of Kabbalah, but uh, through that to the Egyptian uh, thought of, uh, of the, the uh, hermetic uh, uh, system of, uh, of understanding and to, to that of the Eastern non-duality that was all very present in the consciousness of these avant-garde thinkers in the West. And so the Inquisition continued in force, and uh, you saw it in Rhineland, Germany, where uh, Meister Eckhart in the, in the 1600s was still uh, condemned, and, and uh, although not physically destroyed, but Marguerite Poiret was burned at the stake in, in France, and she had no relation to the Jewish communities, but to the Beguines and the fear of women and the the power of the feminist influence uh, to override the patriarchal oppression of the church was equally uh, subversive and threatening. So there were movements of liberation that, that were, uh, were, were constantly uh, uh, erupting in Western uh, Europe, and well, as well as in Russia, in fact. And, uh, and, and was present in the Jewish community in the form of Hasidism. And the, the Hasidim were also excommunicated and to some extent are still considered heretics uh, among many in the, uh, in the Jewish world. Uh, and so uh, this, and they were, they were all had in common a, uh, an acceptance of the non-duality of, of, of the real. Now, the, the, but the most, I would say, profound form of the expression and explanation of non-duality was that of Spinoza. And, uh, and, and that's why he was considered the most dangerous. And why, he didn't publish any of his writings during his lifetime, he couldn't. Uh, he, he would have been, been killed, and it was only after his death that there were these kind of uh, bootleg copies of uh, the, the ethics and the, the Tractatus and, and his, his other various uh, works. But he was, uh, he was forced into, uh, into a very underground kind of life as a lens grinder. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't allowed to, uh, to express his intellectual genius uh, in a public forum for a long time, and he was ignored by uh, Western philosophers. Although, again, in an underground sense, uh, uh, they, they took up his thinking. Leibniz, of course, whom he met personally uh, late in, in Spinoza's own life, was uh, influenced, and so were others later. But uh, largely, he, is, he was overlooked until the 20th century, when he was championed by Gilles Deleuze. And, and you may or may not know, Deleuze wrote two books about uh, Spinoza's philosophy and, uh, and uh, took that as his, uh, his inspiration uh, and, and the, uh, what, what technically is called the, the dual aspect monism uh, of Spinoza. It's actually an infinite aspect monism because uh, Spinoza uh, not only declared that mind and body were two aspects of a single substance, but that the, uh, the consciousness of God or nature, right, because uh, Spinoza defined God as nature, uh, has possibly an infinite number of modes that we're just not aware of because the human intelligence is too limited and uh, it based in sensory apparatus that prevent it from recognizing anything other than mind and body as modes of intelligence. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other modes that are simply inconceivable to the human level of, uh, of, the, uh, of the consciousness. But in any case, uh, you can map uh, Spinoza's teaching and, and Ramana's, and they're almost identical. And, uh, and I think that's important, and we are going to study, actually, uh, Spinoza's teachings because I think it's important to recognize how profound Ramana is and how, 
how much he is at the highest level of what Western philosophers have been able to reach in, uh, in their highest flights of the, their creative thought. And, uh, and not only uh, Deleuze, but Lacan was a confirmed Spinozist himself. And, and Lacan said that nearly all of his own uh, inspirations for how he understood the structure of ego consciousness was based on what he learned from Spinoza. And I think if either of them had uh, been aware of Ramana's uh, existence in India, they would have gone there. Uh, of course, it was during World War II, and they were trying to survive uh, from the Germans uh, taking over France and uh, probably wouldn't have been so easy to do, whereas it was easier for Jung to go there, and Jung, of course, also very much inspired by, by Ramana, but of course at the last minute got cold feet, and we know about that story. But uh, what's really important is this, uh, Jung carried on a dialogue or a correspondence with a man named Wolfgang Pauli for a number of years. Pauli was one of the leading quantum physicists uh, back in the 30s. And uh, he and uh, Erwin Schrodinger, as well as pretty much all of the others, Max Planck and uh, Heisenberg and Niels Bohr, all of them were very much into the study of non-duality. But those two particular, Schrodinger uh, and, uh, and Pauli, were, were, were dedicated to the study of Advaita Vedanta. And uh, Schrodinger also studied Zen and Dzogchen Buddhism. And, uh, uh, but, but he was uh, very well read in Eastern uh, non-dualist thinking, as well as in uh, Spinoza's uh, writings, and he, he based his correspondence with Jung on the recognition that Jung had written about synchronicity. And he said, well, isn't synchronicity the very expression of non-duality, of the fact that physical events are actually psycho psychological or psychoid, he probably would have said, events. But you cannot say that a synchronicitous occurrence is either physical or mental. It's one. It's a, a unified field that is uh, a monistic expression of both a mind and uh, the unfoldment of the explicate order of the material world. Much like David Bohm then later went on to uh, declare and to, to uh, theorize about. So we, we have a history in which the, the leading thinkers, both in physics and metaphysics, were all converging upon the same recognition that had been realized by Ramana when he was 16 years old and hadn't read anything. But he, he got this, and he got it in a clearer way than either Spinoza or quantum physics or any of the other theories. And he went right to the heart of the, of the issue and discovered the way out of this knot of the physical and the mental that he said was not simply an integration, but we had to unravel the knot in order to transcend both the mental and the physical in order to get to the self. So you, you see, he, he, he went beyond this uh, dual aspect monism and discovered that both of them were derivatives of a source that uh, we, we cannot reach through either uh, physical uh, uh, attempts at experimental understanding of reality or of trying to mentally get to the root of the problem because the, the source of awareness can never be grasped by the mind that treats everything as an object because the source of awareness is not an object and can never be objectified. Therefore, you cannot grasp it with thought. It's literally inconceivable. Unattainium, right? That's what we understand. You can't grasp it with thought, but also thought can never get away from being haunted by the fact that it cannot know itself. It knows that it, 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 it is aware, 
that, that the, the physicist or the philosopher understands that their thinking derives from awareness. They cannot deny it, which, which goes back to Descartes, whose famous, uh, you know, cogito ergo sum is based on the fact that, okay, I, Descartes, may be totally in a matrix. This may all be a delusion. There may not be a world, or I may be uh, under the influence of some demonic uh, force that, that causes me to think I'm in a world. I can't know uh, whether what I perceive is real, but one thing I cannot doubt is that I am perceiving. There is perception. Whether the contents of that perception is accurate or corresponds to some reality beyond itself or is, is consistent within itself, I may not be able to know that. But what I can know and, and I am forced to recognize is that the, that the awareness of something uh, that is perceived is real. That can't be doubted. So. Uh, he, of course, misphrased it as, I think, therefore I am. All you can really say is thoughts are appearing, therefore th there is a real to which these thoughts are appearing. You cannot even say that there is an I. And you see, this is where uh, Ramana went beyond Descartes or Spinoza. You can't, uh, you can't posit that the I thought itself has any reality. But you can recognize that an I thought appears, and the I thought, when it appears, also uh, appears uh, as a being in the world. Whenever the ego arises, the world arises. When the ego disappears, like in deep sleep, there's no world. So there's a correspondence uh, between the physical and the mental, but there's a real that doesn't disappear even when there's no ego and no world, as in deep sleep, because you're, you still exist, you still are in, in deep sleep, even though there is no mental activity taking place. And of course, the same in a samadhi state of Jagrat Sushupti. So the, the implications of Ramana's teachings go beyond that of Spinoza, and they resolve the problem that quantum physics has not been able to resolve. They're closer to it now since Bell's theorem and the, uh, the whole, uh, the whole uh, let's say, theorization of quantum information, because now they have shifted from an ontology that's based on the belief that particles are elementary to reality, and rather than thinking particles are, have some independent reality of consciousness, they say, no, there's only information. But what is information? Information is not, is not a, a, any objective bit, uh, uh, but, but simply a, uh, a concept, a notion, or, or a binary decision, a yes or no, up or down, one or zero, made by consciousness. It's nothing other than consciousness itself, okay? But it is consciousness that is uh, separate from uh, whatever are the bits that seem to arise as its own contents, okay? So again, uh, what quantum physics comes down to is that we can measure anything that appears but we cannot measure everything because what is causing its appearance does not appear and cannot be measured, right? So quantum physics has come to the limits of its own possibility of knowledge. And that limit is the same limit that uh, is expressed by Ramana as the ego, the I thought. If you want to get to what is real, you have to penetrate through the I thought to get to pure awareness in itself that is not configured by the illusion of being a, a something or a someone within a projected uh, universe of, uh, of bits of information. But prior to the projection of those bits informa of information and, and from the inherently indubitable source that is projecting those bits of information that are interpreted by a mind as a world, uh, there, there has to be an unknowable, unattainable, and yet uh, more real than whatever appears reality that is supreme and, and from which our world is derivative. 
and derives whatever seems to be real within our existential flow. But uh, the, the true source of our own being cannot be known so long as we are identified with a body and with a mind. We have to get beyond both of those aspects to the true substance of, of both mind and body that is, uh, is referred to by Ramana as the self. Okay, so we, we, we have a philosophy of, of Ramana that sums up the uh, achievements of, of the mental refinement of the capacities of thought that are, have been expressed as both quantum physics and the, the highest forms of metaphysics that have been achieved in both the modern and postmodern idioms in which thought has expressed and come to its own limitations, which ha have pretty much come to the same uh, uh, conclusions, which in, in Derrida's case were only that uh, reality to be, to be known in its truest sense must be deconstructed to whatever level we are capable of deconstructing it, which is pretty much the same as what Ramana is saying is self-inquiry. What are you doing in self-inquiry? You're deconstructing the illusions of your mind. You're disbelieving in them. You're recognizing that the awareness cannot be identical with its contents that are simply projections of uh, ideas that are prior to the appearance of a person that is only an artifact of that very appearance. But so long as you're identified with the person, which is the bodily form that seems to be thinking, then there is no way to penetrate through this veil of illusion, maya, in order to, uh, to reach the real. So Ramana's teaching went beyond physics and metaphysics to show directly how you attain the real. And there's only one way to attain the real, which is to investigate it without the help or the distraction of thought. Okay, that's what Atma Vichara is. Mm -hmm.